I have had zero positive experiences. I go to the bathroom, I pull out my phone, and he has texted me, I hope you're enjoying your PCES. It may seem like there couldn't be a worse time to be alive and single. And then texted me asking if he could come home with me. Just like a slew of like, like poor dates and like mediocre dates and dates. But the truth is that for as long as it's been around, dating has always sucked. It's the late 1800s. These are the presidents. This is how people dress. This is the music they listen to. And this is how single people get together. I see you've already chosen your corner. <laughs> Better known as calling, it's the predominant mode of courtship among the middle class. The basic setup of calling was that a woman would have uh, hours when she was receiving callers at home. This is Moira Weigel. I'm a junior fellow at Harvard University and the author of a book called Labor of Love, The Invention of Dating. The basic script is that a man shows up at your house, asks whether you will see him, and then you sit together in a parlor and sort of spend time together with either direct or sort of from the next room family supervision. Sounds super hot. At the time, 75% of Americans lived in small towns or on farms. If you think meeting someone at a bar is tough, try finding a spouse in a town where you'd only encounter a handful of potential partners in your lifetime. And while it may seem like the way we date is dictated by things like love and affection, it was actually driven by something far less romantic, the Industrial Revolution. In America in the 1880s, 1890s, you have these floods of migration, both from the countryside to the city and from other countries to the United States. As the country industrializes, urban populations explode. The population of New York increases seven times between 1850 and 1900, and Philadelphia's goes up 12 times. So you only have people going out into public spaces and meeting and mixing in this way that we call dating. Once you have lots of young people moving to cities, and especially women entering the paid workforce. Many women step outside their homes to work for the first time, and that gives them exposure to potential suitors in a way they never had before. Courtship shifted from something that happened in private, tea and supervised small talk in your home, to activities that happened in public, going to restaurants, movies, and amusement parks. From that point on, in order to meet somebody, you had to spend money, and dating became entangled with the economy. After World War II, the American economy flourished. Between 1940 and 1960, the GDP soared from 200 billion to 500 billion. The economic boom after World War II in the United States means that young people have much more disposable income than they've ever had. By 1956, there were 13 million teens with an average income of 10.55 per week. That's the same amount of disposable income an entire family had 15 years prior, and they wanted to spend it. Unlike previous generations that were expected to help support their families, this new generation had time for leisure and recreation. This consumer-driven period was about affluence, and the dating scene closely reflected that economic prosperity. Shiny new cars, rock and roll, drive-in movie theaters, and don't forget about going steady. There was no looking back after that. A disposable income and access to technology democratized dating for decades to come. We're riding on the internet Access to the internet meant access to more people. From 1995 to 2005, the number of internet users worldwide increased from 16 million to almost 1 billion. As with every previous era of dating history, um, there's sort of this new economic sphere and romance and flirtation becomes part of how it gets commercialized. So chat rooms about sex or the opportunity to flirt with people online is a big part of what's appealing about AOL. By 1999, there were already 2,500 online dating websites. But the big moment came around 2010 when mobile phones started changing the way people connect. Because in the 90s, I think there's still this sense that the internet is sort of you know, it's cyberspace, it's this other universe that lives in your desktop and that you go to sometimes and chat with a stranger. Once everyone is carrying a computer on their person at almost all times and our physical and digital lives are interwoven, that really changes the dynamics. It's no surprise that dating piggybacked on this explosive growth. Dating apps. Dating apps. Dating apps. According to a recent survey, 77% of Americans own a smartphone and 15% of American adults use dating apps. Grindr launched in 2009, Tinder in 2012, and now there are hundreds of dating apps to choose from. So meeting new people has never been easier, but 
Does that make us any happier? Dating is kind of a necessary evil. The thing about online dating is like you don't trust anyone. You get to like pin your top hate or like and this guy hates abstinence. Every new technology, every new kind of social practice inspires anxiety about how folks are meeting and pairing up. So dating still kind of sucks, but that's nothing new. My name's Tian, I'm gonna be 25. Uh, I'm looking for someone who comes from a long line of European nobility. Um, absolutely, that is like cri critical for me. Someone whose family has land holdings uh, across, the, um, ideally, the south of France, and will take me vacationing in their summer castle. I'm interested in going to bed early, uh, to wake up even earlier, 